Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Stacks Developer Degree. My name is Hardik. I'm going to be your instructor throughout this degree. Um, it's absolutely amazing to have all of you here. This is the very first lesson to enter into the world of Bitcoin and Stacks. And through this degree, by taking this course right now, you're positioning yourself at the cusp of a big technological breakthrough when it comes to blockchains and building apps on top of Bitcoin particularly. So for this lesson for today, we're going to go into understanding Bitcoin a little bit, what it is, how it came to be, where it is today, the pros and cons, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so welcome to the introduction to Bitcoin lesson. So the objectives for today is number one, understanding what Bitcoin is and how it works. Number two, learning about the history of Bitcoin and how it became what it is today. Number three, uh, understanding proof of work and how that helps secure the Bitcoin network. And number four, understanding the limitations that exist with Bitcoin. And this course is for you. You're a good fit for taking this course right now if you have some level of programming background, ideally in functional languages, but that's not necessary. Um, you're familiar with blockchain technology to some extent, even if it's uh, non-technical understanding and believe in decentralization and are optimistic about the future of Bitcoin and the whole landscape of opportunity that comes with being able to build on top of Bitcoin. So let's start off talking about what is Bitcoin? So Bitcoin is a uh, cryptocurrency, right? It's a decentralized system of money. It's a cryptocurrency that was created by this anonymous person or group of people named Satoshi Nakamoto back in 2008. It's ever since, so it's been about like 15 years since it came out. And till date, it's the largest blockchain network in existence in terms of assets and the, the financial value that the network helps secure. And basically what it does is, you know, there's traditional fiat currencies like the US dollar that are controlled by central banks and governments who can manipulate the money supply. Whereas decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are governed by code, mathematics, and cryptography. So that makes them, that gives them the property of being resistant to censorship, corruption, and interference from a single entity. Even though like Bitcoin is widely regarded as the first ever decentralized cryptocurrency, the concept, the idea of digital cash and digital money predates the invention of Bitcoin by several decades. One of the earliest proposals in that area was David Chom's eCash. Uh, this came out sometime in the 80s. Uh, which was also an anonymous digital currency system. And it laid some important groundwork for future digital cash systems. And there was also another notable precursor to Bitcoin, which is Vedai's uh, B Money proposal from late 90s and outlined the concept of a cash system that could be secured by a proof of work uh, mechanism to defend against attacks. Uh, B Money never ended up being implemented but it did sort of introduce the ideas of having a decentralized ledger and using proof of work to create an incentive mechanism to sort of you know help secure the network which foreshadowed uh some key elements of bitcoin bitcoin as of itself you know, can be traced back to 2008 uh where satoshi nakamoto published this paper titled bitcoin a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system interestingly what happened was that you know, Satoshi didn't really invent anything completely net new. Everything that was outlined in this paper was based on concepts that were already existing. And the ingenious of Bitcoin really came down to how those ideas were put together and made into a sustainable network that secure itself. And the key problem that he solved was using proof of work to solve the double spending problem. The double spending problem is the case where counterfeit money can exist on the network because some malicious actor is able to spend their tokens twice, right? So like if I have like one Bitcoin, if I can at the same time send that one Bitcoin to both Alice and to Bob, that's the double spending problem. And how do you secure against that is... It's, it's a much harder problem than it actually sounds, right? Like, normally in centralized banks, it's very simple, right? More, dear. Come on, more. Give me some more, more, even more, dear. Come on, come on. How the... Wait a minute. Whereas in a decentralized system, it's much harder to keep track of, you know, who's spending what money and 
how to make sure they aren't double spending that money. It's not like Proof of Work directly solved that problem, it more so created incentives, both positive incentives and negative incentives. So let's let's talk about Proof of Work, right? How does Bitcoin even stay secured? Um, so clearly, like Proof of Work is the consensus algorithm. It has been used for over 15 years and the network is still safe as of today. Um, it secures over a trillion dollars worth of assets on the network today. and is regarded as the largest bug bounty in the world, right? If you can figure out how to break it, it's the largest bug bounty in the world as of right now. Let's let's define what what is consensus, right? We talk about proof of work being a consensus algorithm. What is consensus? So the dictionary defines the word consensus as a general agreement about something, an idea or opinions that are shared by all people in a group. So when it comes to the technical definition in the context of blockchain tech, consensus means that all the nodes across the network around the world can all agree on the current state of the network, right? Um, and the state is basically, you know, which transactions have happened, in what order did they happen, what are the current balances of all the users, you know, things like that build up the state of the network. And consensus in this context means that all the nodes around the world can agree on that state and they all are looking at the exact same state. Um, so consensus protocol then are the rules that the network defines that allow these nodes to reach that agreement. Now, how do they reach this agreement? And primarily it is economic incentives. There are positive incentives for good behavior and there are negative incentives for bad behavior. So theoretically, it is possible to quote unquote control Bitcoin or any blockchain for that matter. If you own a significant majority of the nodes on the network, validation nodes or mining nodes, and if most of the nodes are agreeing to a fake or fraudulent state, uh, then yes, like you've gained control over the entire network. But realistically, for you know, these big networks like Bitcoin and Ethereum as of today, that sort of attack becomes economically unfeasible. It, is, it requires a massive, massive amount of financial investment to even have a chance at trying to do that. So how does all of this work? Um, the proof of work algorithm has a few key aspects. Uh, the first is we'll understand block production. So blockchains, you know, as the name suggests, um, they are formed by having a chain of blocks, and a block is basically a group of transactions, right? Um, so then the blockchain is a group of blocks that are order ordered in a very specific way. And ordering is very important over there because, you know, if like if I receive money from Alice, then I send that money to Bob, that order is very important. I can't first send money to Bob and then receive money from Alice because that would mean my balance went below zero. Um, that is not possible. So ordering is very important. Um, so each block has an ordered list of transactions inside of it. And then the overall blockchain is an ordered list of blocks overall. So when users, uh, you know, when users are making transactions like transferring BDC around, um, these transactions need to be included in some sort of block. Uh, that block needs to be published and shared with the rest of the network and get included on the blockchain. Um, so this process is called block production or the creation of new blocks. And it is done by the set of actors called miners. And miners are a specific type of node on the Bitcoin network. They're called mining nodes. And mining nodes are basically competing with each other at any given time to produce the next block, to have the privilege of producing the next block. The competition exists because whoever wins that competition, whoever is chosen to be the block producer for the next block is rewarded with new BTC tokens being minted, right? And so, so they get money for being the block producer. So they're all competing against each other to try to become the block producer. And this competition happens for every single block, right? Like they have a competition, somebody gets chosen as the block producer, they go on and produce the next block, and then the whole process restarts again and they're in comp competition again to try and be the block producer the next time. And this competition, this race to try to be the block producer 
what it happens over there is there's a computationally hard puzzle. It's a mathematical puzzle that these miners have to solve. It's a kind of a special problem. It belongs to a category of mathematical problems called NP. And NP problems have a special property that, you know, finding out the solution to an NP problem is really hard. But given a potential solution, it is very easy to verify if it is correct or not. So as the example, you know, let's say you have like a credit card, right? And you need to figure out what the CVV is for that credit card, right? The pin. So there's a thousand possibilities, depending on what credit card you're using. There's thousands of different possibilities for what the CVV could be. And it's not an easy problem to solve, right? It's There is no algorithm to it. You just kind of have to try every single possibility and hope that you lock out. So it's kind of a hard problem to solve. But if you say you have found a solution, it's really easy to test it because I can enter that CVV and see if, like, if the credit card payment goes through or not. So that's like a very simple example of what an NP problem looks like, but much larger in scale, like much more than just a thousand possibilities, right? We're talking about hundreds of millions of possibilities existing, but if somebody claims they found a solution, it's really easy to verify if they actually did find a solution or not. Um, so all these miners are out there trying to solve this NP problem. And whoever is able to solve it first gets chosen to be the block producer for the next block and gets that privilege and then earns BTC for doing that. So that is one thing. That is one thing to keep in mind. Like That's how block production works in proof of work. The next aspect for proof of work is civil resistance. And you know, how does this actually help keep the network secure? So the miner's job, right, since we said, like, the, the job of the miner is two things. Number one, take incoming transactions that users are creating and group them together and produce a new block. And then that's the job of the block producer specifically. And then for other miners, their job is to verify uh, that the block producer put it together correctly, like validate those transactions, make sure no double spending is happening, and also validate that, uh, you know, the block producer did actually solve that NP problem we were talking about. So overall, as long as they do those things, you know, forget about why they're doing those things, but let's just say as long as they're doing those things, the network is basically secure, you know, like the block producer puts together a block and all the other miners are now verifying is there an invalid transaction over here? And did you actually solve the NP problem? So as long as they're doing that job, the network is secure. There's no double spending happening. Um, and you know, the for the block producer, they get new Bitcoin for producing the block. So they have a positive incentive to try to win and become the block producer. But if they lie and if they don't produce a valid block, the other miners won't agree with them. And they won't earn any Bitcoin. So that positive incentive, first of all, gets taken away if you lie, right? Secondly, um, so, so there is a positive incentive, basically, if you act honestly. And secondly, to reach agreement on the state of the chain, you always need a majority of the nodes to agree with your block, right? And the solution to your puzzle. This will not happen as long as, you know, at least half of the nodes are honest and don't accept fake blocks. On the other side, Solving that NP problem is also really hard. You know, these miners are spending a lot of resources in the forms of electricity, computer hardware, maintenance, you know, human resources to sort of try to compete and become the block producer every few minutes, right? They're spending a lot of resources in hopes to earn that new Bitcoin. And if they lie, not only do they not get that new Bitcoin if they get caught, but also they just wasted a ton of those resources, right? They just paid a ton of money in electricity bills and computer hardware and human resources for no reason. So not only is there a positive incentive to acting honestly, there's also a negative incentive to acting dishonestly, right? So it's both of those things combined that sort of create the network effect that most of the nodes are acting honestly. And this all comes back down to 
you know, how proof of work helps secure the network. Um, so we talked about block production. We talked about how that process helps keep it secure. And there's this other aspect now of civil resistance, right? A civil resistance, um, what civil resistance means is it's the measure of how strong a protocol is against what is called a civil attack. Uh, now, what is a civil attack? A civil attack is the problem where one entity or one person pretends to be many different entities, right? Um, and security against this type of attack is very crucial for a core uh, decentralized blockchain because it that is the only way to allow miners to be rewarded based on the effort they're putting in instead of how many people they're pretending to be. For example, let's say that block producers were chosen randomly. Like they don't need to solve a puzzle. They're just chosen randomly. And let's say there are two people on the network. There's Alice and Bob. By random selection, both of them have like a 50-50 chance, right? Like they'll both get roughly half the rewards um, because they'll both roughly be chosen as the block producer an equal number of times. Now, let's say Charlie comes along, and Charlie, instead of being one person, like he is one person, but he pretends to be two different people, right? Charlie and Darcy. And now by random selection, 50% of the time, it is Charlie who is going to get chosen to be the block producer. But realistically, in a fair world, he should only be chosen 33% of the time, not 50%. This is bad. Proof of work helps solve this and protect against civil resistance because instead of random selection, you have to solve that puzzle. And that puzzle is a computational problem. It's a mathematical problem. The only way you get faster at solving that puzzle is by throwing more resources at it, right? Like adding more hardware, adding more computers, increasing your electricity bills. That is the only way to actually have a higher chance at solving the puzzle. And because of it, it doesn't matter if you pretend to be one person or if you pretend to be a million people, because at the end of the day, if you have the same amount of hardware uh, that you're putting towards trying to solve that puzzle, your probability of getting chosen as the block producer remains the same. Right? How many people you pretend to be becomes irrelevant. So proof of work also has the civil resistance mechanism to help keep things fair. And your probability of becoming a block producer stays proportional to how much resources you're putting into it. Now, when we talk about this, uh, there's one question that also commonly comes up is, isn't it possible for two miners to arrive at the same solution at roughly the same time? So yes, it is. Occasionally that will happen. Occasionally two different miners will solve the problem roughly at the same time with two valid solutions. And this is what ends up in what's called a fork, right? There's gonna be a fork on the blockchain. And you know, let's say Alice and Bob here, they both solve the problem and they both start sharing their solution with the rest of the network, right? They're like, hey, I solved the problem. I'm gonna be the block producer. And they both start sharing their newly produced blocks and their solution with the rest of the network. And they're both, you know, they're not necessarily connected to the exact same other nodes around the world. You know, let's say Alice is in the US and Bob is in India, and they're both like immediately talking to different nodes and they have to wait a while before you know, they connect over the entire world and people figure out, hey, there's two miners who figured out the solution at the same time. So for some time, for temporarily, because they're talking to different nodes on the network, there will be a fork on the blockchain where some nodes on the network will believe this is the new state and other nodes on the network will believe, no, this is the new state, right? So like the, the, the blue chain and the red chain. And that's why it's called a fork, right? But Again, like for blockchains to be stable long term, everybody needs to agree on a single state. You need to pick one. You can't have this fork exist. So to solve for this, um, there's a very simple rule that Bitcoin uses. It's called the longest chain rule. So basically, if there's two forks, whichever fork has a higher number of nodes agreeing to it after you know some period of time, that one will just end up being correct, right? It's 
almost infeasible to say that exactly a 50-50 split will happen between the nodes, right? Like, so whoever has the higher number of nodes, that will end up being the original chain, and the other fork will be discarded. It will kind of be deleted. And the combination of proof of work and the longest chain rule comes together to form what we call the Nakamoto consensus, which is the true overall consensus protocol for Bitcoin. And with that, this brings us into one last concept, um, which is the concept of finality. Imagine you're a user, right? You send somebody some Bitcoin and you know your Bitcoin was picked up by a miner, it was included in their block, but turns out that was a fork, right? Turns out your transaction was included in a forked chain, but the rest of the network doesn't actually see your transaction. They didn't put that in their block. Like Alice didn't put your transaction in her block, but Bob put your transaction in his block. So now in the fork, so now if Alice's chain gets chosen as the longest chain, Bob's fork will be discarded, right? So your transaction will have never existed, right? So, so you sent one Bitcoin, you know, Bob told you it was okay. Maybe the recipient also saw that it came to him, but then after some amount of time, suddenly it's like that transaction never existed, right? It's gone. So this this is this brings us to the concept of finality. So finality is when you can truly consider a transaction to be final. Like it cannot be changed anymore. It is not part of a fork, it is final, this is correct, this is included, you can be guaranteed this is not going to be changed anymore. Um, so when you have that guarantee, that's when it's called, you know, a transaction has reached finality. Um, so finality, how long it takes to get to finality sort of differs from network to network. In Bitcoin, it's kind of safe to say that after around five blocks, so if you send a transaction and like, it's been five blocks since you sent that transaction and it hasn't been reverted so far. After around five blocks, the chance of that being reverted at this point is so low. It's like less than 0.000001%. So the chance of that becomes so low, you can pretty much say, you know, my transaction is final. If you want even more assurance, if you're not even willing to you know, risk that 0.00001%, just wait even longer, right? The longer you wait, the more guarantee you have that this transaction is final, right? Because discarding one block is easier than discarding two blocks, which is easier than discarding three blocks and so on. So the more blocks that have happened since your transaction, the less likely it becomes that all those blocks are going to be discarded because of some different fork. We've been talking about this puzzle. We've been talking about proof of work. We've been talking about you know consensus. Uh, talking about it in a little bit of an abstract way, saying you know there's there's this hard NP problem that miners are solving, and only if they solve the problem they get to become the block producer. I want to talk about you know what is that problem? You know what does what is the work in proof of work? Like what work are they putting in? What are, what work are they trying to prove? So. The let's truly look at you know what this puzzle is and how it works. Um, it's a little bit surprising if you're if you're hearing about this for the first time, you might be a little bit shocked. Maybe, huh, that that doesn't make sense. But let's keep in mind. Let's keep in mind what is the puzzle supposed to do, right? The goal of the puzzle is to simply prove that a miner spent energy and spent resources trying to find a solution. Right, because at the end of the day, all we're trying to do is we're simply trying to create a negative incentive for lying, right? And that negative incentive exists as long as you know we're able to say like, oh, did you did you make a fake block? Oh, you just wasted all your resources for nothing, right? So we somehow need to like you know make them spend those resources in the first place. So that negative incentive is in place that, oh, shit, I've already spent like, uh, you know, $1,000 in electricity bills. Like, if I lie now, that $1,000 was nothing. So goal of the puzzle is nothing more than just making them spend their resources, right? It just needs to be a hard problem. It doesn't matter what it is, right? 
keep that in mind. Like this is this is kind of a subtle but important thing to understand. Like what the actual puzzle is is relevant. Um, it just needs to be hard, and it just needs the miners to be spending a lot of resources. So, like how exactly that puzzle is solved, what it exactly is, isn't super important, right? Um, so, in the interest of you know not reinventing the wheel and keeping this lesson reasonably at like a reasonable length, there's this amazing video by Three Blue and Brown. It's called "How Does Bitcoin Actually Work." Uh, it's on YouTube. Go check it out. It's short, like 10-15 minute video. He does an amazing job at explaining what the actual puzzle is with like nice animations and everything. So go check that out if you want to take a look at that. But um, but yeah, like TLDR, the actual puzzle doesn't matter as much the as because the only goal is we just have to make them spend their resources, right? It's just like a random brute force thing. Like these miners, they're just brute forcing millions and millions of different combinations trying to arrive at the perfect answer. So after, you know, Bitcoin came out, like, you know, 2008 was the paper, 2009 was when the network came live. And, you know, one of the biggest inventions after Bitcoin in this space was Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum came out around 2014, and it is very different from Bitcoin, right? Like Bitcoin was supposed to be a decentralized cash system, right? P2P money. Whereas Ethereum came out with the idea of like a world computer, you know, that anybody can build applications on top of Ethereum. And it was like a shared big world computer that anybody could build and deploy their applications on and anybody could use those applications. And these decentralized applications, they're what's called smart contracts on Ethereum. Bitcoin by itself doesn't have that capability, right? Like Bitcoin is fairly limited in terms of what you can do on there. You can transfer BTC around, you know, but, and there is a scripting language in Bitcoin, but it's very, very limited in its capabilities and what it can do. But it's nowhere near as close to how expensive Ethereum is. Um, but with that said, even with having s such limited functionality, Bitcoin still is the largest decentralized network in the world, right? 15 years after launch as of today, it secures over a trillion dollars in assets, right? A trillion is a lot, right? So clearly there's a lot of interest in Bitcoin, both by users and by institutions. And therefore, uh, you know, efforts are being made by developers to build apps in a way that can work on top of Bitcoin instead of, you know, things like Ethereum or whatever. The idea is, like, there's a trillion dollars of money locked up in Bitcoin that is unproductive, right? What I mean by unproductive is it's just sitting there. You know, there's nothing for those assets to do. Whereas on, like, a, you know, smart contract chain like Ethereum, you know, there, there's DeFi, you know, there's lending, borrowing, you know, yields, interest, staking, there's so much things going on. There's the assets over there can actually be productive, whereas Bitcoin has a trillion dollars of unproductive assets. And we've seen, you know, like modern, like cross-chain bridging solutions and everything, like people moving BTC out of Bitcoin onto another chain to get like a Bitcoin equivalent token just so they can make their assets productive. So the future of Bitcoin is, can we figure out a way to build apps directly on top of Bitcoin and make those trillion dollars of assets productive? And this is where Stacks comes in, right? We'll, we'll dig deeper into Stacks. We'll learn more about it in the following lessons. We'll dig deeper into it. And, but basically, Stacks allows you to build apps on top of Bitcoin. That's all for today. Um, hope you enjoyed this lesson. Uh, hopefully it was a good introduction. Hopefully you learned a couple of things about Bitcoin itself. With the foundation now set, we'll move on in the next lesson. So start talking about stacks and digging deeper into stacks and how it actually helps you build on top of Bitcoin. If you have any questions, reach out on the Learn Web3 Discord or the Stacks Forum for help. We're always happy to help you out. But peace. I'll see you in the next one.